All right, so we can start now. Um, so uh, good afternoon and welcome. Um, my name is Maristella. I'm instructional designer here uh, at the Carlton University. And um, welcome to EDC. And thank you for spending your lunch hour with us. Um, for the past uh, five years, I have been designing online courses and blended courses and online modules and educational resources. And um, many times when I work with instructors, and some of them are in this room, the question comes up, um, how should I record those lecture videos? Should I be seen in those lecture videos or not? And this is why the title of this presentation, To See or Not to See, and um, unlike Shakespeare, I'll give you the answer right away. Spoiler alert, it depends. And this is what this session uh, uh, will be about. And in particular, I would like to focus on these type of lecture videos where the, the video of the instructor actually appears in the corner of the lecture video. Why? Because this has been almost uh, like accepted way of recording videos by massive online open courses like Coursera. Uh, someone at some point, I guess, decided this is the way to do it. And that's how they do it uh, most of the time now although they have played with different versions of this, and this is what we're going to talk about today. Um, because I wanted, obviously, to talk about this for, for a long time now, but uh, I was waiting for some good research to come out, and, and luckily they have done some. And um, also another reason why I was always reluctant to talk about this is because I knew that at least in the first part, of a session like, like this, we will have to touch on some theory. We can't really even go in discussing um, you know, the variables that we need to take into account when, when we're recording uh, videos if we don't talk a little bit about learning with multimedia. But bear with me. I know that at Carlton we use different types of recording lecture videos. I'm going to show some typical examples. But I hope what I show you today uh, is going to be relevant and you'll be able to apply some of that in, in any uh, situation when you are teaching with multimedia. So by the end of this session, or you know, sometimes in short sessions like this, you will have a presenter saying, by the end of this session, this is what you'll know and be able to do. I want to be more realistic in line with my line of business <laughs> and uh, base this a little bit more on you know, uh, research. So actually, by the end of this session, what you'll be able to recall will largely depend on what you already know about this topic. Uh, what is your interest in this topic? Uh, did this presentation even keep your attention? Um, was it presented at the right level for this audience and for this amount of time, right? And were there many distractions or not? So to start, uh, I would like to play a short, just a couple of minute video from one of Coursera courses. This is the course I enrolled in just now. I'm one of those you know, million people who just click to enroll because I want to see how it looks. And uh, on the side, I don't want to talk about MOOCs, but I'm still surprised when people say, oh, but you know, the retention is so low. Of course it's low. You just click and you enroll. But nevertheless, um, there are still thousands of people who do finish these courses every time they run, even if you have 300,000 who enroll. There are some good 2,000 who finish. So these massive online open courses are now a wonderful, uh, fertile uh, ground for, for research. And Coursera has done some. So here is me, I enrolled in one course here, and I want to play you this video, uh, just, of course, a couple of minutes of this video. Um, don't worry if, you don't, if this is not uh, something you, you understand and know, maybe you do. I don't know all of your backgrounds, but just for you to experience um, how does it look for a student. And, and, and after those two minutes, you might realize that uh, just for yourself, you might find that this is very beneficial, that you really like to, to see the instructor, not just to hear him, right? Some of you might find that it didn't do any good. I mean, you were focusing what he was talking about, right? And some of you might find it distracting. And, um, and again, this is what we are talking about today. It depends, right? And, uh, and I want you to think about this as you watch this video, whatever your preference is, to remember that this is your personal preference, right? And um, this is, this is actually a problem we have in this field of education, I have to share with you. And it's not just my uh, uh, assumption and my, my thoughts, it's, it's been shared by, by some leading experts in the field. We have a problem because many times in education, um, people present on things or, or accept as a rule things that don't have any, um, you know, really grounding research. 
sometimes we share things, uh, and I've been, of course, one of those sometimes before I learned better, uh, that are based on, on beliefs, on anecdotes, on personal preferences but not necessarily on, on what really works. And when I say what really works in education, what we mean is, did students learn better by using this strategy or not? Or were they more motivated or more engaged? And luckily, some have done some research on this. So let me see if, um, if this uh, uh, system not work, now works for me. So let's just, watch, uh, let's just watch a couple of minutes of this. The course is currently live. Um, you can go ahead and register any time. Uh, um, a, a set of nodes, or 25 nodes, in a ring lattice. And so initially we're connected. Each node is connected to its two immediate neighbors. So if we look here, we have node 1, and it's connected to node 2 and 3, and also connected to 25 and 24. Right? So it's got these connections going here and here. Um, and then each one of the nodes is, in terms of these, uh, in terms of the red, have connections to the, the different neighbors. Okay, so we, we, we're connected to your two neighbors. What that does is, in terms of this original lattice, is give you very high clustering. So one is connected to both two and three, and two and three are connected to each other. One is connected to two and 25, and two and 25 are connected to each other, and so forth. So the clustering is, is high when you start. And then what you can do is, is actually what I've done in this picture is not rewire the links, but just add a few random links. So let's just stick a few random links in the network. And so what happens is initially, if you wanted to get without these initial, without these random links here, if you wanted to get from node one to node 15, your path length would be quite far, right? You'd have to go sort of marching around this. Oh, I find this interesting, so we could keep watching, but uh, <laughs> I'll have to pause here. Okay, so now you had a chance to experience what we are going to talk about mainly today. But this is my agenda. I would like to talk a little bit at the beginning about instructional design relevant principles that are based on cognitive theory of multimedia learning. I'm going to show you some examples of uh, Carlton lecture videos, how we do things here. And then I would like to share with you some research uh, results from some studies done by Stanford and other <laughs> universities. And I hope I will, um, at the end, be able to provide you with some suggestions on what to consider next time when you're deciding on um, how to record your lecture videos. So let's start up over. Let's go back a little bit, right? How have we traditionally transfer information? How did we traditionally teach? It was always, for a long, long time, based on verbal communication, right? We would uh, write those poems that rhyme, and we were able to you know, transfer that information to the next generation. And then even when we started using books, first codex, and then later, um, um, yes, <laughs> um, printed press in 15th century, we started using books more and more for teaching and learning, right? But again, it was verbal communication in a textual format. And of course, at some point, we started using um, graphics as well. We can go back to you know, books from 18th, 19th century that use graphics with text. But uh, in the 20th century, apart from graphics, and this is where the elephant comes from, I've been asked you know, for someone else <laughs> why elephant, we started using graphics and video uh, in education. And if you're one of those students like me, <laughs> you're probably very happy when you see the instructor rolling, teacher rolling this into your classroom. And I have to say I experienced this, experienced this as a teacher myself teaching here in, in schools in Ottawa. Students loved it. We loved video. Why? I'm sure there are several reasons, right? First, it's going to be a different class. You're going to, you know, the break the, the, the usual teacher in front of you. And then it's going to be dark, so no one is going to ask you to take notes. But oftentimes, they were fun. I remember playing for grade eight, uh, Bill Nile, the science guy. Those videos were fun and sometimes more fun than what was happening in the class. So there is a place for video in education. We, we like to see them. But um, how? Uh, today, of course, any CU Learn page in your course can contain now everything, all multimedia in one page. Uh, we, we use images, and then we use videos, and then we use text. It, they can all be, as you know, if you're teaching through CU Learn, um, existing on the same page. And then maybe, some, maybe also, um, oh, it doesn't exist here. 
but I wanted to show maybe also the video of this tractor in the corner. So the question, of course, came up uh, a long time ago, not, not uh, these years. How do we learn with uh, in a combination of text and graphics? Can, can images, pictures help us learn? The short answer is yes, and I'm not going to go into this research. This would require much longer than uh, this short presentation. But yes, I mean, in general, pictures can help us learn a lot if they're used proper way, in certain ways. And there are ways to use pictures that's not uh, beneficial to learning as well. But to go into this topic, I, like I said, I need to at least touch on <laughs> Richard Mayer's um, and cognitive theory of multimedia learning, which is largely based on John <coughs> Sweller's um, cognitive load theory and Alan Pavia's um, dual coding theory. We have to at least, I admit, at the very surface level, touch on them because, again, we can't talk about this topic if we don't, if we're not on the same page about this. Um, even back in the 19th century, William James, famous uh, psychologist, told us about this attentional spotlight because all the time, even now in this room, there are a lot of visual and audio stimuli that you're exposed to. Maybe your phone is now telling you that there is a new message coming up. Maybe you want to attend to that. Maybe you're looking at me. Maybe you're looking at the slides. Maybe you're looking at uh, Patrick and Bob. And, um, and then audio. You hear um, audio coming from the hallway, from the, from the outside. There is some construction happening. There is me talking. So the first thing that needs to happen is you first have to decide which of these information to attend to. And now thinking about your students and what we are presenting them with, we have to make sure that their attention is as much as possible on the stimuli that we would like them to attend to. So if I present this, uh, Richard Mayers, actually he presented this, this theory in a very um, simple format. Um, first, the information coming mainly through your audio and through your visual channels. And this uh, sensory memory is it's very short. It's literally a few seconds, at which point you have to decide on, okay, what am I going to do with, with this? The information comes into our working memory. I know I'm explaining this at a very, very superficial level. And then we have to, make, we have to combine these two, right? Information coming through our visual channel, information coming through our audio channel. How does it combine? And can we organize it somehow so that it makes sense? And can we also integrate it with the prior knowledge, with some pre-existing schemas we already have? So this is this three-step process, the three, step, uh, three assumptions that we have. The dual coding assumption, the limited capacity assumption, because this is the most important thing. Our working memory has a very limited capacity. Different research says uh, different things, but usually five or seven plus man, minus two or three pieces of information we can hold in our working memory at the same time. Unless we quickly make sense out of it, you know, if you're remembering phone number, trying to sing it or whatever, it's going to be lost in a few minutes. So this is, in a nutshell, <laughs> cognitive theory or multimedia media learning based on um, cognitive load theory. Again, in a nutshell, when we're talking about cognitive load, we're talking about mental effort that we need to um, uh, use or, or apply in our working memory. So in terms of instructional design, we usually talk about three types of load. So we're now talking about the information that our students have to import and digest for some meaningful learning to happen. The intrinsic load is the load of the content itself. It has its own complexity, right? So it's not the same if I, as a math teacher, teach students addition and if I'm teaching them differential equations or triple integrals. The material itself has its own complexity, the number of elements, the interconnection. I can't usually change it as, as a teacher or even instructional designer, but I can do things to help it. For example, some pre-teaching where I teach students first about um, the, the different concepts, the different words that we will be using uh, in this presentation so, on, or lecture, so they, they can all follow. Then we have something we call germane load. This is everything else we add around that content that's supposed to help students learn. This is what we are talking about, adding images, underscoring, highlighting, circling, anything, adding some audio that's actually very related to what we are teaching. So this is what we call germane load, and this is what we can control and we do in instructional design. And then there is extraneous load. And it's everything else that requires cognitive processing, and it's not really supporting learning. 
uh, example of this would be, you know, if you use slides that have very busy templates, so there are colors and, you know, some images around there that are, you know, driving students' attention. If you maybe go on YouTube and watch some instructional video and there is audio playing in the background and, and you're supposed to now focus on the, the, the words the instructor is saying and then the audio and that can be very detrimental, right? So, all this together, if it doesn't overflow the working memory, we are fine. So when I said depends, that it depends, it's going to, you know, flow over this as well, because um, it really depends on a learner. If uh, you are an experienced learner, if you are not a novice in the field, then, you know, you have more of that long-term memory and more um, capabilities to deal with, with the cognitive load that's presented to you. So you might be able to juggle this. But if you are a novice in the field, if you don't know much about the topic, all, uh, everything else, like extraneous load, is just going to be, uh, you know, not adding to your learning, let's say, nicely. So this is of obviously the example of an <laughs> extraneous uh, load, and we sometimes call it um, seductive detail. But it's actually a violence, violence of something that in multimedia learning we call coherence principle. Um, this picture has nothing to do with that, right? And it does look funny, but I attended conference presentation by instructional designer who in every slide had an inner corner image of her cat. And cat is cute. Of course, images have nothing to do with slides, and uh, this is an example of you know, something that's going to draw your attention, seduce you, but really doesn't help learning. Because at this point, I'm explaining something there. It's very complex, and it's not helping. I want to show you a different example, just to complicate things a little. Um, I'm teaching students about squares. What is a square as a geometrical shape? And I either say this, or they read this. And this is all true. It's, it's not, we can't say it's extraneous. But I'm teaching about something that should be presented visually. And, and students, if you just read this and they have nothing to look at, um, this, is, um, this is a problem. You might get uh, something like this in your class. Um, and then, and I'm sure all of you have been there and you say, okay, this didn't work. Okay, let's try again. Maybe if I do this, and this is the, the, the spatial uh, co coherence that I was talking about. If you're talking about a square and showing an image of a square, show it at the same page. If this square was on another page, if students have to flip the book, this is all lost. So now you see how things are getting actually complicated, as you know when you teach, and I know we have a lot of instructors here. What media should I use when teaching this particular topic, this particular subject? It, it is not simple, right? And it might depend from lecture to lecture, from part of the lecture to part of the lecture. So our goals, of course, are to completely reduce extraneous load, if possible, to really carefully juggle this germane load and to see what we can do about intrinsic. But you see how it looks like three colors here, but it's not really black and white. It's complicated because we are today talking about instructor's face in a lecture video, and we can I'm sure all of you can see how it can be actually a germane load. It can help students in some cases. If it's very important for you to see me while I'm talking, so that you maybe understand if I'm um, joking, or if I'm being sarcastic, or if I'm showing something with my hands, of course. Some students benefit from lip reading. Uh, many online students say it, it really brings a social presence. I feel you're here, I don't feel disconnected. So it could be germane load. But it could be extraneous load as well. It could not be helping in some situations. So let's uh, step back and, and, and see what we're doing here at Carlton. Uh, I'll show you a couple of examples of how we record lecture videos. I'll just ask you if, if you are one of those who, um, instructors who used any of these, if you just want to put up your hand so that we know that you're here. I'm just glad to say, and I didn't mention at the beginning, that we have people here from Media Production Center, Lisa, a supervisor, and we have John from COL. We have people here who actually do things like that. They actually record some of these videos. So if you want to share with us that uh, you know, you're one of those, um, let us know. So um, first thing we do is we, we record these COL classes. Now, this is not the topic of my presentation, but then it's interesting, right? It's an interesting um, option because um, it's actually a live class. 
But for students who are going to watch it only online, it's online class. And, and here, uh, there is no really split attention effect. And split attention I means when you're supposed to, in the same frame, pay attention to two sources of information coming through the same uh, sensory channel. But here, the camera switches, right? Sometimes it shows the instructor and the students. Sometimes it shows the board. Sometimes it shows the student if he's asking a question. So it's switching frame to frame. So if I'm sitting at home and watching this video, there is no split attention effect. And, and I'm pretty sure I talked to John and people who do this. Basically, they make a decision as if they're in a classroom. Where would I look? And it, it's, it's a different from a live class because when you're teaching in a live class, if I'm pointing, if I'm writing, obviously you want to look at that. But if I now come close to you and I'm looking at you and I'm talking to you, obviously you know now it's time to maybe look at me. So there are those cues in a live class. But in an online class, in this case, there are no cues. The frames really switch and, and you f uh, fall. Can I just point out something? Yes? I just want to point out that in that instance, mm -hmm. the split attention problem is on the instructor. Because the instructor, Kim in this case, is trying to attend to two different audiences. Yes. One at the end of the camera and the other one in the classroom. Exactly, Bruce. And this is extremely challenging. I always tell instructors I, I, I would find it extremely challenging. Because all the time you have to be aware. And some of those are now uh, live streamed. So you have to be aware that some students are, you know, there. And I know, actually, <laughs> Kim Hellemans, I work with her often. She, she actually looks into the camera and says, hello. She addresses them directly. But knowing that you have two audiences, uh, at the same time, that's not, that's not an easy task at all. Um, we now have some instructors who are actually in this room. I, I saw this. Um, um, Jim Davis uploaded um, a blog and this video in our ED, so not video, the picture of this, in our um, EDC blog. And then I talked to some people from Cyril about this. So now there is an option if you want to actually to include picture in picture, even in live classes, all right? So instructor is talking. So in effect, we have two videos here, right? One video is without Jim. There is, there is sound and there is a visual, right? And then this is another video. There is a visual and there is a sound. And there, this is what we call picture in picture. And uh, John sent me one nicer picture where it looks like um, there is, I don't know if it was intentional, but it looks like there is some interaction between the, the background, almost as if the instructor is in the picture. If you go to studio to do your recording, um, most likely you're going to bring your slides, and most likely the camera is going to switch between you and between the slides. Uh, I have to say, just my personal experience in these five years, I've never done a course like this so that all lectures are recorded in the classroom. Only one specific <laughs> uh, course where we have 22 guest lecture and every lecture is recorded by a different person. So then we go to studio, they're external presenters, they're not instructors, they come from the field, they're lawyers, engineers. So we bring them to the studio to do it professionally. Then again, there is no split attention effect because the frame switches between the slides and the instructor, the slide and the instructor. And again, people in the booth, people behind the camera are those um, who are deciding on when to switch. It is not your decision as an instructor, and it is not the student decision. It is decided for them. And I have to say, most of the time, it really works great. Sometimes it happens that the instructor sees the video and says, oh, I really wish you stayed on this slide longer because of showing something. Or once it, ha it happened that the instructor came back to me and said, oh, I really wish the camera was on me. We have an option, of course, because these videos are usually recorded in you know, just a few minutes. Um, to talk to people who are doing the recording and tell them, you know what, there's going to be this slide, print the slide, show them. I might spend a little bit of time on this. Don't show me, show the slides. But when this is said and done, uh, gay, uh, we give this to students to watch. They don't have options again to do any kind of switching themselves. It's defined for them. Then sometimes I find there are instructors who have some busy background and it, it looks like they're interacting with the background. So they're not really picture in picture. We wouldn't call it that. They're overlaid and they're part of the video. That's not the new, nothing new. If you remember, and Carl Sagan used to do it in the 70s, it looked like he is a part of that picture walking through the solar system with us. And I loved it. I don't know if you did. 
And then we have what I mentioned to you at the beginning, something, I'm not sure what uh, Jacques-Marie used here, but it's something like Camtasia where you have this, you know, home camera and you point, uh, you know, to yourself. And he, he, he is he talking, circling something, annotating, I'm not sure. And, and then there is this video of him in the corner, which is, you know, example of what we are going to talk about uh, in terms of research. Again, as far as I know, students cannot remove this. Once it's there, I know at least with Camtasia, it's there. You can't take it off. It's not like closed captions. So what does research say? All right. So let me walk you through some of these uh, because I know that there are instructors teaching in different modes here, and I hope we will have some, some, some conversation uh, in the second part here. But um, luckily, I just have to say he's not here today. Uh, Professor um, Kevin Chang sent me one of these research, and that's how he and I started the conversation. And eventually, I said, I have to do a session on this because we have some good research now. Uh, but he couldn't be here today. I just want to thank, thank him for, um, for engaging in some fruitful, interesting conversations with me. So um, uh, the first uh, research results, and I really strongly suggest if you're interested, go and read the full research. Of, of course, I cannot go through the whole research and all the experiments done. I'm just going to focus on some that has to do with this topic that, that I'm uh, talking about today. So this was done by Stanford University. Uh, like I said, they offer online courses through Coursera. So they played with different modes of, of uh, introducing instructors' face in the videos. And luckily, they had done some research there. So uh, what they have done is uh, they actually use the eye tracking device. First thing first, to see where do students actually look when you present them with the face. And as you know, and I know we have psychologists here, people from neuroscience, we are very attracted to human faces. If you show someone a face uh, and something else, more, more, most likely even babies, right, they will look at the face. So um, this one was smaller. This was not, not MOOC because, of course, they had to bring students to the university and do and attach those tracking devices, right? But they made sure that all students were novices in the area. And then they use this, uh, exactly what, like I showed you at the beginning, the strategically embedded instructor's face. Sometimes it was there, and sometimes it would disappear. That's called you know, strategic presence. And I want to show you just really a few seconds of um, what they themselves said about their own research, and then I'll continue. Often, a small video of the instructor's face is overlaid on lecture slides. But what effect does this face have on information retention, visual attention, and affect? Through eye tracking and recall tests, we found that participants' preferred face, but recallability, was not affected. We suggest that instructors weigh the costs and benefits of including the face in their online lecture. I just wanted you to hear them, so it's not just uh, <laughs> me. Um, So this, there's, there are these nice images in their um, presentation. And what you see in red is you know, where students look. And when the face is present, um, you can see that there is a lot of red here. They look at the face a lot, and then they look at the slide. When there is no face, then, of course, they're looking more at the slide. And students did show, you know, subjectively, strong preference for instruction with the face. And it's interesting that 41% of the time, students spent looking at the face. So if the face is there, they will be looking at it for a long time. And they switch between a face and slide every 3.7 seconds. So we are talking, uh, again, about split attention effect. Looking there, looking there, looking there. We are terrible, terrible multitaskers. There is nothing there to be, uh, I think, research anymore. We know there are a few people in the world, a few percentage who, who multitask. When we say multitasking, we mean uh, attending to two things that require cognitive processing heavily at the same time. I'm not talking about running and listening to the music. Uh, I'm talking about doing your taxes and answering your emails at the same time. And, uh, you know what we actually do is we switch quickly between tasks. And every time we switch, we, we lose some of that, uh, you know, um, there is a negative impact on learning, let me say it uh, like that. Um, but when they tested the recall, there was no significant difference between face being present and face not being present. 
Um, this research, um, seeing this structure in two video styles, um, this was really interesting study again. Uh, it was Coursera course on programming massively parallel processors. And again, they looked at the uh, analyzed engaged motivational and navigational patterns of learners. So they tested uh, two different types of picture in picture. Uh, one is this one that I just showed you before. And then they started playing with this one, something similar to what I showed you um, at the beginning of the session. You see uh, here instructor is a little bit smaller and it's really picture in picture. This one is recorded with a green screen or blue screen. The instructor is a little bit bigger and it looks like he's a part of the picture. So you see how they are playing with this. They're trying to see because up to a couple of years ago it was always just picture in picture. Then they started playing with this. And I wanted to see again what happens there. Again, luckily here thousands of students, they could have done this research on. Of course, how do you gauge what is happening and what impact it, ha it has? In education, we have to use some proxy variables, right? So they were looking at things like uh, what was the, the amount of time they spent watching? Did they join discussion forums more often? Were they more active when they joined the forum? Certificate earner proportion of was there a higher number of students who actually finished the course compared to others? Here we are talking about motivation. And then they, they also examine coverage. What is the fraction of content and activities that the, the person engaged in. Um, so uh, learners showed strong preference for the overlay mode compared to picture in picture. Um, and that decision they actually made right there in the first week. So if you give students two options, they will, like you saw something this morning, they will very early into the course decide what they actually like and most of them will stick with it. They did watch longer in overlay mode. This is an example that Kevin sent me. Obviously, I'm not taking course in Chinese, uh, but a kind of like unfortunate example of overlay mode where instructor is actually covering the content. But it looks uh, kind of like a regular live class where I'm writing and I'm covering the board, but this is something uh, just to be uh, cautious about. And then this big study by Stanford where all this started, this is the first one that uh, Kevin and I discussed by um, Stanford University. They wanted to see, okay, let's give students an option and see what would they choose if they can choose. Because in others, there was no option, right? So what they did was, the course was on sociology. Uh, they gave students uh, an option in the first week or so to watch lectures in different mode, uh, without instructor at all and with instructor in the corner. And they let students decide what they're going to do, all right? Uh, this was a course in which every week there were about six videos. Each video is about eight to 20 minutes long. And they had weekly um, activities, including the final um, multiple choice exam. So first, what they found in the first part of their research is that 35% of students actually decided to watch without a face. That was their conscious decision. Uh, more than a half, about 57%, decided to watch with a face, and 8% decided to switch. And this is where researchers decided, okay, this is important for us to know and to be able to move forward with our research, because no matter which of these two you decide to go for, instructor always there, instructor never there, at least one third of the students is not really, I don't want to say be happy, but it's not going to be their preferred way. So either 50-something don't like it or 30-something don't like it. Then they decided that it's time to do the second part of the research. They said, okay, all of those who like it, they say why they like it. They like it for those reasons that I mentioned before. There is a social presence. I can connect with an instructor. It's very important for me to see him. I can re lip read. There are reasons why they want it there. But then those who didn't want it there said, you know, it's just, you know, making it harder for me to focus. It's harder for me to, to follow this lecture. So they decided to do the second part of the research where they're actually going to use strategically face. And the instructor would decide when they record this lecture, when does the instructor want the face to be there and for people to look at me? And when I don't think it's important, the instructor would take it away. And they thought that this would be the best of both wor worlds, right? Let's, let's just get the best out of, of technology and help students learn. 
So in terms of this strategic condition, where the face shows and doesn't show, shows and doesn't show. In terms of social presence, students definitely said it improved, it increased the, 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 the feeling of the social presence. In terms of cognitive load, it also went up in a strategic condition. So what researchers found, concluded is, it's not the, the, the case that your face is there or not. It's the appearance and disappearance process that seems to be distracting. But this is important. Learning outcomes, grades, motivation to engage with the material, attrition, no significant difference at the end with the strategic presence compared to constant presence. What they concluded, not me, is that substantial number of learners opted for lectures without talking head, just for us to know that it could be the case, or they switched, that there are definitely benefits of nonverbal cues, but that it induces extraneous cognitive load. And that in this strategic uh, situation, the salience of instructors face increased. So once you're there, I'm even more looking at you. But no difference in learning outcomes. Okay. Yes? Uh, in the one where they allowed people to choose, were there also no differences in grades? Yes. They didn't really see any effect. The effect was subjective. This is what I like, and this is what I don't like. Uh, it's like... I don't want to go into the topic of learning styles again. But some like to study in a busy you know, Starbucks. Some like to study at home. It's a personal preference. Will this align with your better grades than others? The research doesn't confirm that. Um, and not even more engagement. I mean, we talk about motivation to engage with activities. But they didn't see that there is any difference in engagement or motivation. Um, the implication that uh, these researchers came up with is that different styles, you know I said, it depends, different styles of video lectures might benefit from different dynamics for the presentation of instructor's face. And what you have to gauge is what are the relative contributions of providing social cues? How important it is for your particular course, for your particular topic? And that more research should be done on this adaptive or learner-controlled learner interfaces in multimedia learning. Yes, Jim? Why do, why do the papers and you say we should be, like, decide when is it or not if it never makes a difference? Can you repeat the yeah, beginning? Uh, the paper said, yes. and I think you're saying, that we should think about whether it needs it or not. Mm -hmm. But the research says it never makes a difference, mm -hmm. so why, why should we even bother because this time it, thinking about it? Because it depends. Because it's not as plain as even what I showed here, it's mu much more complex than that. There is more to this research if you read about this. Like I said, for example, depends on the level of learners. It's not going to show, this is one case when you do research in education. This is for this cohort, for this level of the course. But what research also shows is, for novices, might be more distracting. For more experienced learners, not that much. They can handle it. It really depends. It depends on what you're teaching. If my background is in math, it's electrical engineering. So when someone was solving problems or, or doing something really complex on the board, I don't need to see his or her face. I really didn't benefit from this. What I benefited from is what is happening here. But when I was studying other things, when I switched to education, we were, we were talking about other things, other subjects, there are definitely cases where it's so important for me to be able to, you know, almost like make eye contact with you and, and look at you and see with your face, what you're telling me. Is so that, it depends. Is that, your, is that your opinion, or is that just the research? No, it's actually what research says. It okay. depends. It really depends. Basically, I'll show you in a moment. Okay. But it depends on your expected level of cognitive load that, that your teaching for that particular day is going to induce. I just want to show at the end, again, I'm mentioning engineering. Yeah, engineers jumped in, and in IEEE conference, they did, uh, they actually did, they, they used electroencephalography, right? To, to check, because previously, when I told you about cognitive load, it was students subjective. They said, oh, it was harder for me. But now they actually plugged in you know, the machine. <laughs> and I don't know exactly how. I don't want to go there. But they can see the level. They, they check the emotional states and somehow through that uh, check the level of cognitive load. In the same case, you know, in strategic uh, presence. And basically, the results were confirmed even through that. In the mixed condition, uh, the cognitive load increased 
So when the face is showing and not showing. But in terms of learning outcomes, again, they didn't see any difference either. So this is what researchers are saying. When high cognitive load is expected, maybe at least don't use the mixed format. Don't add that level of, uh, of uh, interruption to students' attention. So these would be the takeaways that, that, that I hope um, that at least based on my experience, based on what I know, and, and like I said, my, my work and my experience. Uh, when making these decisions, it is not easy. It is definitely not an easy solution. Uh, but I would ask you to maybe try to not make a decision on how you're going to record your lecture video based on what you saw other instructors doing. Because of all of these things we talked about, it worked for that instructor, it worked for that situation, might not work in your Consider how much what you're doing is similar to that. Don't make decisions just based on what you prefer as a learner. Oh, I took this course and I really liked it. Um, because again, where are you in that uh, you know, spectrum of, of experience and knowledge? And where would your first year students be? And don't make decisions just because something is possible. Oh, I have Camtasia and oh, there is a camera. Let me just turn it on because it's possible. Or we have a wonderful studio and we can do all of these things. Um, yes, we can. But let's talk about this. Let's find the, some kind of middle solution, right, that, that would work for, for everyone. So I would ask you to consider the following, of course, based on everything like I said today. Uh, think about your learner's previous knowledge. Who are your students, right? Again, what is the expected cognitive load for this particular thing I'm teaching today or in this course. What is the need for social presence? As always, what is your content? What is the context? What is your teaching style? What is your presentation slide style? How does it fit? What are the available resources? And one thing I would like to add as instructional designers is the ease of updating videos. Because when you invest so much time and effort and resources to record these lecture videos, you don't want to use them just one time. Of course, you want to reuse many of them, but it is expected that next time you're going to teach the course, maybe 30% you will change until you kind of come to the level that you like. But each time you teach, you're most likely going to replace at least some of them. Now think of this, what did you decide to do in the first place, especially if you are showing in those videos? Especially, for example, if you are in that picture-in-picture -picture case. Uh, I talked to John about it, so I decided to re-record three lectures three years from now. And I plug this here, so students are watching my lectures. Some of them are from three years ago, some of them are now. What do you think they're going to focus on, please? Does she have more grays now? More wrinkles? Did she gain weight? Uh, how distracting is that going to be? So keep that in mind that you will be replacing some of those videos when you keep teaching. And how easy it will be to do this. All right. So final word, uh, talk to your colleagues, come talk to us, talk to Media Production Center, talk to people from Carleton University Online. See you know, if you can first maybe collect some information and you have a lot in your hands already because you know the students you're teaching the course before, um, before even you know, making a decision how you're going to do this. All right, so this is a time where I hope everything that's on your mind or <laughs> that you wanted to say and no one <laughs> jumped in, uh, this is a time now to maybe talk. So um, yes. Thank you very much. This was very useful. But I think um, social presence is a very important factor for online learning. And it is something that um, many of those uh, instructors or educators um, that use uh, or um, educate students in, in this specific form of instruction um, find this very challenging. And I think it's challenging, especially because we know that students um, that only um, are presented with this specific mean of instruction um, miss that important factor, which is the social aspect. So I think just the fact that we do have uh, students feeling like they belong to a social group, 
that they go, that they are being part of the group, um, and they, they feel that they socialize with others and socialize with the instructor in that specific manner tells us how important it is to have this uh, face um, in the lectures. Mm -hmm. that the that way we. Can provide we so thank you. So the way we often do it in online courses, we, for example, use Big Blue Button for weekly online sessions. I know as an online student myself, I did my graduate studies in education completely online with Atabasca. It was very useful to be able to see instructor once a week. It's like a Skype-like, uh, Adobe Connect-like session. So you have this opportunity to actually see instructor and talk to them uh, you know, real time. The other strategy we use, uh, Lisa knows, in the studio of, for instructors I work with, we come to studio and we record at least introductory videos for every week. So even when they record just voiceover, for example, using Camtasia, we go to studio, spend literally just one hour there, two hours, they prepare a introductory paragraph for each video. So they show every week, students can see them every week, they introduce the topic that's going to happen that week. And sometimes if they have uh, interviews, they go to studio as well. They record interviews with guest speakers. So we do keep the presence of the instructor. Uh, but here, again, we need to balance how much effort and resources are required to do something as extensive as maybe, uh, I don't know, using this video or going to the studio compared to benefits. So this is where we, it depends and we have to juggle. Um, Yes, that's been. So that was so valuable. And um, I thought what was most interesting about the statistics were you can really see that you're, you're not teaching to just one type of student with different students with different needs. And I'm wondering if the um, solution to some of this might be that the, 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 like the playback design gives the user control over what they see. Exactly. Uh, I would like to compare this with closed captioning. We have a player and you have a CC button. And many of us benefit from it. I still like to, when I watch videos in English and if people speak very quickly or if it's British English, I like to you know, use captions. It helps me. It helps many students. But for many, it's very distracting. They don't need it and it's just there and it, it just drives your attention there. But our students have an option to turn it on and turn it off. Uh, and that's the best of both worlds, but not with the... With the Can I follow up to but, there, but the study shows there was no difference in engagement or grades. So why, why give them a choice? What in these particular courses, there was no difference. But giving them a choice, I would give them a choice same as closed captions. People benefit, like lip reading, for example. Many people like to see the face so they can read especially if the speaker is not Eng a native English speaker. It really helps to have other captions or being able to read. Okay, so it helps with probably a small portion of the groups that said it didn't affect the, the It helps some, differences. but all those who liked it said they really want it. But it was personal, exactly like you said. They couldn't see any impact on the learning. I'm just, don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> I'm just but showing the result. 57% of them Yes, yes. But it's similar to, you know, the research shows for closed captions that 80% of people who use closed captions are not hard of hearing. Uh, they still use it because for them it's beneficial. Yes, Bruce. Yes. I think um, you had a question. I, I just wanted to point out the, just about the, uh, the closed captioning thing. I saw an industry report just this week that showed that a large proportion of students actually you did use the closed captioning, mm -hmm. which I found was really interesting, and many of them not uh, yep. uh, English as a second language students. It was just it, a lot of them seemed to find to get value out of, out yes. of that, at least from time to time. Maybe not for every lecture, maybe not for every module, but sometimes when the, you know when the when the, when the, the content yep. is particularly complicated, or maybe they were watching the lecture on a bus. Noise and stuff exactly. And many other things. But you you pointed something again going back to what Jim said, but so interesting and so complicated, because we know the research says it does uh, cause split attention effect. It will, so it will drive your attention, but it's going to take it. Away. I know when I'm watching a movie and reading, reading caption, I miss what's happening back there. Oh, she just blinked. I didn't see it. So we like it and it, we're dreaming to it. But would it be better for those who don't need it, maybe for that option to not be there? 
The answer is not easy. Nothing in education is easy. You do one research in one field and then it doesn't apply to others. It's very difficult. But, uh, but at least we can start. We can, we can start considering certain things and not just take for granted. This is what Coursera does and let all of us do. So let me ask uh, Lisa. Lisa, yeah. Do we have the technology here which would allow students to be able to, to uh, put the, the instructor in or out on, on, a, sort of, on a dynamic basis? No. No, no, not no, yet. But, but, but. Okay. <laughs> yeah. One thing about the picture in picture, from a technical viewpoint, we would do live recording. Uh, we won't use the uh, corner light unless we can make a plot at least 25% of the screen. The size, yeah. I don't think it works if you just see a tiny little head uh, in the corner. You can't even really see the eyes or the lips moving the night. But from a technological perspective, it's not a problem to do it, right? It's not a problem at all to do it. In, in those, uh, we are talking about live, like CEO courses. So you think the benefits wouldn't be that? Yes, it's 25% of the screen. And I know that Jim leaves us about the corner of about 25% of the screen. Yeah, I leave a spot on my slides for that. Mm -hmm. Was it Irena? Yes, Irena. Yes, uh, well, thank you. I, You're welcome. I also assume that you know, social engagement was an important part, and hearing this actually kind of makes me question if this is really not my own preferences. But i got to tell you, that the first video you showed us, I actually was so distracted by that man who wasn't even making eye contact while his slide was behind him that I actually think that you know there's there, there, there really is um, a potential downfall of including this as kind of really new. So, uh, one of the things I wanted to, to ask is if you have a sense of this, and I mean, maybe I'm just bold because I found the supports at Carlton amazing for doing this. But this kind of model where, you know, you have the, the entire screen is taken up by the instructor for a few moments when they're mm -hmm. just explaining something mm -hmm. that doesn't require a slide, mm -hmm. and then the screen switches over mm -hmm. to the slides. Mm -hmm. Is there any research that you're aware of that kind of looks at how effective that is? Because that to me kind of seems to be addressing both of those mm -hmm. things. There is a study, and it's done uh, by Harvard University, and they did with 20,000 users on edX. So edX is similar to Coursera. So I can share that study with everyone who is interested in the room and can send you. In their case, uh, it seemed that the preference was for that model, and it seemed that it also produced a little bit better results. So, but, but in my opinion, whenever we are looking into results from a MOOCs, it's a little bit different than results from our regular undergraduate classes, because when you think about who, who is enrolling in MOOC, I'm enrolling, Maristella is enrolling, uh, many people who already have undergraduate or graduate degrees, so it's a kind of a little bit point. different group of people, but I, I can send you that study for sure. Thank you. Oh, was there, yes, <laughs> have a couple of like, minutes. I mean, that seems like a fairly obvious, like a split attention is the problem. I mean, these are kind of, like the thing that is this what was distracting to me was the instructor was doing this and it was showing up over here. Mm -hmm. Now that's obviously split attention. Mm -hmm. And, and that's what combining it, the instructor points to the screen or or you know, trade off. The instructor speaks, something else happens. So that's exactly what happens when you turn on this camera and you're looking at your slides or writing down most of the time you're actually not going to be looking into the camera. You're looking at your tablet or whatever you're doing. So that's a problem for sure. But on the other hand, then maybe it's easier to ignore him then than if someone is really, you know, engaging in that corner, then you're even more attracted to that, to that uh, corner. Again, it depends. It really depends. Um, that's what I would like to leave you with. There is no one size fits all. There is no simple answer to, to be or not to be or to see or not to see. It depends case by case. But... Uh, uh, I hope we had the conversation today, and um, thank you for coming. Come to EDC, and we'll continue the conversation. Thank you.